Good morning. We are live. <clears throat> the title of this live stream is not going to be the immediate focus. First thing we're going to be looking at and covering will be the YNW Melly uh, murder trial. Um, we're going to be checking out a video of a channel that I like, uh, who has been covering the tr trial from start to finish pretty much. Breaks it down and includes video in it. Um, so we'll check him out. Um, if you haven't already know who he is, I'm going to be leaving in the description his uh, channel after the live is over and everything. And I'll shout it out right now. And that is C U F B O Y. It's Cuff Boys. He is 2.5. 15 million subscribers make sure to go over there give him a like make sure you, or a subscription make sure your bells turned on all and hit the like button all right let me start it back to where at the beginning i was already looking over it turn on the camera for you guys we use this camera because it shows better quality all right let's begin count one and two of the indictment of the crimes of first degree murder. If you find Anthony Williams. The closing arguments for the YNW Melly murder trial just happened and it was intense. The prosecutor laid out tons of evidence that points towards the back left seat of the car and phone data that puts Melly in the vicinity of the crime scene. Then Melly's team points out a few holes in the sloppy investigation and more possible suspects that were never investigated. This was one of the more intense days, so buckle up. Hit subscribe right now, follow me on all my social media. Thanks for the support. Let's get right into this. Thank you, please. First look at Melly. You looking tired, like always? The defendant in this case has been accused in count one and two of the indictment of the crimes of first degree murder. If you find Anthony Williams and or Christopher Thomas were killed by Jamel Demon, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the killing and decide if the killing was first degree murder or manslaughter or whether the killing was excusable. If you find that Jamel Dennis committed first degree premeditated murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, Shout out to mango, raspberry, watermelon, a hint of apple juice, and water, and a banana blended up with a pro zinc and probiotic shot is the fucking bomb. He actually possessed and discharged a firearm. You should find him guilty of first degree premeditated murder. You should find that Jamel Dennis committed first degree premeditated murder but did not actually possess or discharge a firearm during the commission of the offense, you should find him guilty only of first-degree premeditated murder. The judge is just clarifying the charges. I'm going to be, uh, once I can, I'm going to try to uh, start making uh, content that's going to be uh, featured as, you know, the raw smoothie type stuff and the what goes into it, the prep, what the benefits of it is on your body. Uh, I tell you, like, I'm hoping that it, uh, you know, because I'm not taking the uh, the clean stuff that I got. I'm not taking it right now um, because I didn't want to have. Uh, how do I put it like this? I didn't want to have. Uh, two different reactions where I'm already trying to cut down and I didn't want to be forcefully uh, trying to push shit out my system while on this table so that's why I'm not using the uh, parasite cleanse formula herbs in my smoothie morning Jack you go pee pee you go poo poo good boy come on you eat your vitamins too didn't you Yes, you did. Give you some water, buddy. It's too early to eat. You know, nothing right now. I wish you're not really begging for food. But you look like you'd take some. <laughs> just to the jury so they have a clear perspective on what they need to try to think about pretty much because this is a big decision like think about having someone's life in your hands pretty much not taking melly's mom yeah, that'd be man 
the nerve wracking experience I'd be on like I, and, and that's what's funny because I always thought like I'd be eager to sit on a jury and help uh, figure something out but man the more complicated you see how these cases play out and what's all on the line I don't actually think I want to be a juror <laughs> Three point one rules of deliberation these are some general rules that apply to your discussion and if I find out later on when I die or something that i was a part of, the, of a group of people that helped put away an innocent person, like even unknowingly, uh, I'd fucking, that would suck. Two, this case must be decided only upon the- Oh God, she looks nervous. Obviously, any mom would be, but can't imagine the victim's families as well. My condolences to the victim's families. I try to say that- Let's take a moment of silence to remember the victim's families in this uh, moment, because we got to have to remember that uh, a life was taken, and or excuse me two lives were taken and you can't the impact that has on the family and others you just can't uh you, you can't stress it enough so we're going to take a moment of silence Amen. Um, also, just in case if anyone asked, because uh, I just had the thought pass by my mind at the end of that. Um, yeah, I started the cleanse before I stopped it whenever I had made the decision to do this, just in case people ever even wonder. Well, hey, I thought he said he already took some. I, I did. I did start taking some of it, but I didn't get to the point where I got to keep going or I wasted it. I, I still it pretty much, you know, I only took two or three doses out of it and that there's more than enough to do uh, from what Dr. Day told me. As much as I can, but rest in peace, Sack and Juvie. The lawyers are not on trial. Yes, rest in peace to Sack and Juvie. And to their victims' families, you know, please pray for them. And condolences. Your feelings about them should not influence your decision in this case. Whatever verdict you render must be unanimous. That is, each juror must agree to the same verdict. It has to be unanimous vote for guilty or not guilty. And then uh, death penalty actually only needs eight of them to vote for death penalty if he's guilty first, obviously. He seems so calm. It's kind of crazy. You're supposed to be calm in the situation as a defendant, but like, damn. Then the, the defendant can help them to actually possess a firearm. Then you check the appropriate box either yes or no during the course of the crime. Commit that the defendant should help them to actually discharge fire. You check the appropriate box either yes or no. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I can get out here before you and say the defendant that he is murdered in the first degree. And the law is clear that this defendant committed two counts of first degree murder. And this judicial system. He got a fire of a pro. Man, he probably, this is not the type of prosecutor they, his defense attorneys or anybody want to be taken because she is zealous. Does not work without being. We have two dead bodies. That are dropped off at Memorial Air. Christopher Thomas and Andrew Williams. You have Portland Henry, who's lying about anything and everything. He's lying about the location of where it happened. He's lying about when it happened. He's lying about the, Mr. Dennis, the defendant, being in the car at any point that evening. We then have the cover up that begins. Why does there need to be cover up? Because there was a murder that was committed, ladies and gentlemen, that's why. So Detective Moretti and the Mayor Murphy's Department have to. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And the fact that the decision to dry. Eh, People can look at it any way they want, but when somebody gets hurt and the first reaction isn't call 911, it's, oh, hold on, hold on, we'll drive them somewhere, drop them off and take her time. And, you know, because one that throws off police being able to collect everything, it gives them time to stage, you know, the shooting and stuff that they're alleging that they did to make it look more like a drive-by and all that. That's, I mean, that's a pretty good indicator. I, I would have been hammering, why did you not call 911? And they're going to say, oh, he had just got shot. We wasn't thinking he's our friend. We wanted to get him to the hospital as quick as possible. And sometimes when people are driven in personal vehicle to the hospital after a shot or something, they do make it, but by and large, 
they usually uh, the one the cases I've seen they don't and a lot of cases where crimes have been committed that's exactly what they do is take them that's the first thing the person is thinking of is we got to get them out of here into a hospital without being seen hopefully by a lot of people answer four questions who what when and where sergeant williams came in and testified and showed you how blue star works showed you how shooting reconstructions are done with the trajectory rods trajectory rods are so important in this case this is not a drive-by that there the, um, the trajectory rods and the lack of key holding, according to experts, it is not a drive-by. So the jury, you know, that, that that's what I'm saying. And they have a lot of, and, and from the latest, uh, what we heard late, they got a name wrong. The jury did and asked for clarification. And as a result of that, the defense moved for mistrial because uh, the latest I heard was that they were kind of sort of deadlocked. You know, they had one side of the jury thinking this and the other side thinking that. So we don't know what's going to happen. They're coming in at 90 degrees. There's no keyhole. If you remember, you learned about keyhole. That would be an angle of entry on that. Like only one bullet had a keyhole uh, shape to it, which meant that there was a uh, movement to that bullet. But every other bullet hole in the car indicated like a perfect circle. I think the car wasn't moving. Chemical reacts no matter how many years later, no matter what attempt at cleanup is done. The chemical is still going to react to the presence of the blood. And that reaction, ladies and gentlemen, tells you that someone is sitting in the seat. Yeah. And he was in that seat. That's bad too for Melly. You can clearly see someone was sitting there. And who was the last person on camera getting in that seat? Was Melly. Where the blue star isn't. So where there is no blood. There's no blood where someone would have been sitting. There's no blood where their legs would have been. And you can see on the V that's indicated on that killer was sitting there. And there's no blood because something is blocking it from getting onto that area of the car. We know that there's also that this door was closed. How can that be said? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the blue star here shows that this door was shut because there was blood. On this one, the headliner shows the way Anthony Williams' head was positioned when he was shot. Anthony Williams, the way his head was in that Jeep, is that he is sitting in this front passenger seat. And as you can see, all the blood is dripping down the back of it. That tells you, ladies and gentlemen, and from the angle of entry when we get to the medical examiner's information, that his head was right here. Cortland shirt that shows uh, blood, I believe, at certain spots that indicate he was in the front seat. Belongs to Anthony Williams. That during the course of this shooting, Cortland Henry has his back against the driver's seat and is driving wearing this shirt when the shooting occurs. Because if he was the shooter, the angle to get that wouldn't have the blood on the front of the shirt. To get the blood there, he would have to have been completely turned facing backwards to Mr. Thomas and then turned and shot over his shoulder to get blood on the back of the shirt. That's not reasonable. He's really shitting on the defenses, a whole narrative that it could have been Bortland right there. That tells you that his head was not upright, but it was leaning over to the side. Because if you recall, the entrance on Mr. Williams is back behind his left ear and the exit is up here in this room. You know, based on his head angle, that it goes out the window, blows out the glass. So what do you know about Christopher Thomas's wound? That it's coming in at almost 90 degrees on the left side of his face, and that there is stippling. You learned about stippling. The imprint of unburnt gunpowder into the skin of a living human being was approximately three inches to no more than three feet. Coming from the rear passenger side, you're not gonna have that same stippling on Anthony Williams. From the headrest of the seat. Because the seat's in the way. This one is important because this is talking about strike K. So why is strike K important, right? Strike K comes in and hits the front of the rear door. This is such a good visual of this because it proves that someone got out of the car and stays a drive-by kind of. Why would this door be open when they were getting shot in a drive-by? Like clearly the person that was sitting right here got out. That, that door was open when that drive-by was taken. Because as you And there you have the reason why there wasn't a stop call 911 wait for professionals because that's not gangsta from Sergeant Williams, if this was actually a drive-by, <laughs> this is what he would have seen. Strikes he had murder on his mind. In at different angles, at obtuse angles, there were the angles of entry, that this is one of three times that Dr. McDougall could ever testify what was the fatal shot and which shots were postmortem about the stippling and the pattern that you learned the distance determination and you learned that the wound through his head was the one that caused his death. You heard Dr. Sauter testify that the lungs bleed profusely if the person is alive. From all of this, at this point, the state has established that there was someone in that rear seat. Someone who was in that rear seat is the person who committed this murder. The question. Mm. 
Yeah, I'd say they have. Then it's who? The state has proven. Who? Push him out and track the defendant wearing that lyrical lemonade sweater. I got, he did this in a lyrical lemonade sweater. Lyrical it's, lemonade sweater. It's crazy. Where he gets in, the spot the murderer set that phone. Always, always, always in his hand. He doesn't let go of it. Still in his right hand as he's going to go get in that rear driver's side seat. That satchel and the one that you see Christopher Thomas wearing are never recovered. I pointed this out in my video earlier today. Why are bags disappearing? That's so sauce. You can order a key. Doesn't let go of it. Exactly. Well, the... The small, and I, I uh, picked on with that fad. I bought me a mini backpack, although I bought mine from Walmart, you know. <laughs> it ain't no Gucci bag or nothing. But you'll see a lot of people, especially in this culture and the rap culture, like Gucci bags and a little, like, mini backpacks. So those are, those are trendy. Those are hip. Like, people using them. They like them. Um, he got his phone in his hand. What do y'all think is in that bag? Pew, 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 pew. Still in his right hand as he's going to go get in that rear driver's side seat. That satchel and the one that you see Christopher Thomas wearing are never recovered. I pointed this out in my video earlier today. Why are bags disappearing? That's so sauce. You can order a pizza by sending a drop in. We rely on them in everyday life. So let's go and talk about the T-Mobile and the Sprint records. So gentlemen, I encourage you to go through and look at those records. Jamie King was paying for the phone of Anthony Williams and Jamal Dennis. Doesn't mean she was using in fact, she's listed under the billing <coughs> list, and that's her number. Yeah, Melly's team tried to say that it's not his phone because it's registered under his mom's name. Uh, yeah, we know all about that. That's that's when people put things in other people's names. That way they have, um, you know, reasonable doubt. You know, they're like, hey, that's not mine. You know, why ain't it in my name? You know. I mean, I'm pretty sure every single one of us growing up, Headphones under their mom's name. I still have my phone along with my uh, nephew's mother and my brother. We all still are on a family plan. And I'm the youngest one on the in the family on the family plan. It looks like Melly had a 491 second phone call with Frederick Givens at 5.04 in the morning. From Frederick Givens, Frito Bank. It lasts 491 seconds. It's not like there's no cars, there's nothing out there. There is things that corroborate that cell phone evidence. And you have Travion Glass in that front passenger seat. Ladies and gentlemen, watch that video, please. You can see Mr. Glass moving his hands. You can see that he's awake. So at 4.03 a.m., ladies and gentlemen, we have a very specific location. The network thinks the phone is. You've learned that at the end of Pembroke Road, out here to the east on this map, there's another set of closed gates that prevents any further eastern traffic. Most human beings can't run 60 miles per hour on their feet. <coughs> So if you think about the speed at which your phone is traveling, that's going to tell the cell phone company whether it's mobile, <clears throat> inside a building, or outside. Once you hear all the facts laid out like this, it's like shit, dude. A lot of it points right to Melly, man. And this isn't oh, this was this 100k track. Melly's manager's there finally. He hasn't been there at all. He looked at not just one phone, but compared and contrasted two phones. That the phones of Mr. Demons and Mr. Williams travel in. 3.20 a.m., 40 minutes, <laughs> all the way out to U.S. 27 in Denver Road. On October 26, 2018, Jameson Francois' phone... Is oh, so they're showing where they believe it most... That, that's why they were... Oh, okay, so that's where they took the vehicle to stage the... Mm. It's out there in that same U.S. 27 in Denver Road location. So is that Mr. Dennis. Very odd location to go to. Nothing out there, except... Yeah, nothing out there that early in the morning or anything except evidence of a cover-up or murder evidence of a murder am i oblivious or i i didn't realize that they had francois phone tracked to that location with melly's phone at noon oh it's over with boys that is so hot boy why would they do this with their phones on them yeah like that's <laughs> you, you would have thought that they would have had burners went without phones you know, so, something else, but no, no. The phone, ladies and gentlemen, number one thing that's going to liable to get you caught up in uh, anything if you're involved in anything bad. You better not have a phone near you. At 4.40 a.m. Remember the tiny advanced hands. So at this point, at 4.40 a.m. The prosecutor also has that tone of kind of condescending towards the jury, but it's her trying to get across how simple it is, low-key. But the phone doesn't make outgoing phone calls on its own. The phone doesn't send text messages on its own. That takes user input. 
at the drop pin at 4.42 a.m. to Frederick Gibbons. Such a damning drop pin, dude. If he lost that phone, why is he sending a drop pin at 4.42 in the morning? So let's talk about whose phone it is. I don't even know what a drop pin is. I guess it's dropping your location. All of these photos, all of these FaceTimes show the defendant. There is not a single instance that's been put before you. Yeah, that's his phone. In that phone, which is in evidence, it states. Oh my god, that's so bad. Speed run of photos <laughs> of him using the phone. 64 of the extraction, and then the phone itself as well. This jail calls a conversation between Melly and his mom. And it basically proves it was his phone because they're talking about giving the phone to track and the passcode and everything. He just said, you put money on my phone, but the number he called was 9807, which is the phone they're denying in trial. But he just called it my phone right there. Yeah, that's... <laughs> that is the phone number that's being called. That's being identified as my phone. Anthony is saying, myself, Mr. Jennings, Mr. Thomas, we're the CEOs. Sagtasia was talking crazy, dude. The defendant has to be picked up from the side number group. That's that drop-in that we talked about in relation to the pastor. That phone is being used by the person who committed the murder. And then, given the only evidence before you, the only evidence is that the only person that used that phone was the defendant, Jamel Sands. Because you learned they were dead for some time. And look, there's no way to put an exact amount on there. But they were hurt for not eating when that drive-by was staged. I still can't believe this trial's... Yeah, they're hurt. Wow, their hearts weren't beating when they staged the drive-by. So, yeah, because you start, I'm starting to think about this, and for them to try to stage it as a drive-by, they'd have to kill them first. That's just, oh, man. So, I don't understand what did, did they not immediately go out right after killing them to stage the drive by or was there 10 to 12 hours of time later? Are you telling me that they left these guys bodies in the car and then drove them out to that? That don't. I'm going to have to look at more of this. Uh, it's real. Hmm. Like, holy shit. 1,397 steps. 945 meters. And then you can go back, and this is in evidence, you can look through and see when the defendant's at the studio in the recording studio, you don't see this type of movement. You would have zero if the defendant was on the bed with the cell. Not necessarily true. All right, I'm at 91 steps for the day. Don't judge me. I, I woke up and immediately started recording. <laughs> I'm going to close my phone and just start jerking it off, dude. I swear to God, yeah, like, that shit is not that accurate because... Brownie gets recorded steps he probably shouldn't have. I get recorded stuff that, you know, like the, the whole steps tracking thing is not too accurate. And it just added fucking 50 footsteps for me jerking off my phone, so. Alicia Holmes, I think it is safe to say. That's what I'm saying. And I'm okay with that. Because my job is to prosecute the crime and prove that it happened. He did remember one very important detail. Mr. Dennis, on a FaceTime call, with her daughter. She was asked if it was new about the drive-by shooting because the cover-up has already started. And remember, Cortland Henry is at the hospital. 435. Mr. Demons is not. To try and get away with murder. Whatever was said on that phone call was so troubling and so disturbing to Ms. Holmes that she and her daughter then drove immediately to Broward County. Doesn't know her 17-year-old daughter's phone number at the time. This is not a common sense. A mother is going to know her child's phone number. That little detail about the $5,000 that she got, she says, oh no, that was, that was for a vacation. That was hush money. That's what that $5,000 was. Oh, real quick, click the acorns, look in the description, and that was hush money. Best $5, and you get a bonus $5. So you get a free $5 right now if you invest $5 on the acorns app. Great app. Go do that real quick. Mr. Last said, Mr. Dennis was not in the car at Red Mitsubishi at any point on October 26, 2018. Trayvon Glass said Melly wasn't in the car, but Adrian Davis says he was. Someone's lying. That explains why eight people. They're going to the exact same location, but stop on the side of the road. One person would switch car. No reason whatsoever. Switching of the cars narrative is fucking stupid. I'm sorry. The cars are tracking together. The phones are tracking together. <coughs> All the way through until they get to 184. So this casing is at the passenger, rear, driver's side, floor. The exact seat Mr. Demons was sitting in. 
in a plastic bag. This cartridge casing is found October 26 of 2018. And we go to November 21st of 2018. Are consistent and fired from the same weapon as the one inside. That he doesn't have a weapon for comparison. And he gives a list, 30 or so weapons, that could have caused this particular casing and projectile. Yeah, Jamel demons never tested on 10 26 2018 so a lot of kids say melly didn't have gsr on him he had no gunshot residue on him he was nowhere to be fucking found obviously they weren't able to test him for g yeah and he probably took a shower and everything else by the time they got to him there's no gunshot residue left gsr you don't have that right so you have a three component gsr and a two component gsr two of those because he was never tested because he didn't speak to law enforcement that day he didn't go to the hospital no he's never tested no. for gsr because he, he 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 knew not everything, but he knew some things. He knew that the what the procedure would be like. So that's why he yeah. These things on the side of the road. I'm sorry, but I, I'm saying it now at 13 minutes in, this dude one, is fucking guilty. One casing inside the Jeep, all fired from the same firearm. God, when they really lay out all the evidence about, here, it doesn't look I too mean, good. I mean, that's the problem. That you're talking about people and rappers, which are part of the culture, no snitching, you know. Even if it was all one person's plan that pressured it on the others, they still are like bred and born into this thing of you don't tell uh, the truth to the authorities you just don't they that that's the whole game we're the bad guys and they like to you know they the peoples and they gonna have to catch us dead to rights you know which is so you know, uh, blatantly portrayed by the culture and the rap songs and different things. But on the exact same token, also in the culture, you have, you know, like the conversation of excessive policing, over policing, police brutality, and wanting to, uh, all that idea of wanting to end policing and stuff. You know, police are there for the the criminals. You know, if we didn't have police, we would just be living in complete and total anarchy all the time. People could do whatever they want, whenever they wanted to, like, like in a fucking purge scenario. So, I, I just find it funny that one of the some cultures that cries about abuses from the police actively talk about how they ain't going to work or try to help the the law solve any of those cases even the cases where friends of theirs was killed and they might know something they still ain't going to talk because that breaks code that's how embedded that culture is <laughs> so let's go to the dm the rear driver's side door handle interior very strong support for christopher thomas limited support that anthony williams is also included and very strong support that Jamel Demons DNA is on that one. The evidence clearly shows the defendant is a G-Shine blood gang. And in <laughs> benefiting the defendant and promoting or benefiting his position in the gang, it then helps the gang itself. I've been calling. Look at them fucking long ass nails, man. I can't stand my nails to ever get that long. bullshit on that this whole time, I know, but I don't think he killed his two best friends to get further in G Shine. But if Melly really did this and killed them, it was just a big emotional fight. It wasn't a fucking gang killing. And look at that, there is a benefit. I, I, I tend to agree with what, uh, dude, what Cam just said. To both sides. The gang gets notoriety, gets money. The defendant, he gets access to different venues. <laughs> This is a planned drive out to the edge of the Everglades. This shows pre-planning and premeditation. This is a consistent, quick, no stops, no detours. So having the firearm already. And they can, how do you know that they have the firearm already and the defendant had the firearm already? Because he asked for it the day before. Sent a text message to Anthony Williams <coughs> asking, where's the firearm? There's multiple discussions about this firearm. Where's the firearm? This is discussed. That is not a lighter. That is not a really great song. That's a firearm. But look at the stress. Being placed on this defendant. Where they fight? Where they fight? Yeah, where they fight? Who's handing those? Look at the tension on that, right? There was definitely tension Brandy, between where they fight, and bro. Melly. Where was there enough fight, tension Brandy? for Melly to shoot him in the head? Is that what you call I'm the two sure. brands? Like, so no? look at for premeditation. You can also look at the 
the manner in which the homicide oh, was committed. Like the motive is still treat not it. the best for the prosecutor. Like, She's showing there was tension and there was shit going on behind the scenes and it could have been for the gang. I don't think she's proven that there was a really solid motive, in my opinion. Enough for him to kill his two best friends. Like, shit had to have gone really left. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you the murder of Christopher Thomas was premeditated in that as well. So look at that. Those are all things in which you can get premeditation. How it was committed. The wounds that are inflicted. The back of the head. Also remember Facebook. In the live stream of him all happy the next day at the video shoot. And so the question was posed about a contractual agreement and losing my- That. I mean, they're going to argue, oh, you know, we was trying to celebrate that life for our, you know, people to, no, man, you, you would not be in the mood to do some shit like this if your two best friends of yours just got killed and, and you almost got died too, but you lived in a drive-by. I'm, no, sorry. Because he did, wasn't worried a couple of months before about missing a show because he was getting his hair read and losing $1,000. When his friends were killed, he's dancing and partying around. It's where you contractual agreement. That's a good point. He missed a show for getting his hair done that one time. He didn't miss a video shoot over his friends dying. Oh. What'd I say? God. I submit to you evidence very clearly shows the defendant was caused by Janelle Dennis. So from all those unlucky 13 <clears throat> people that are, they have one thing in common. They made a single online threat in poor taste. Yes. Any other evidence that ties them to this case? No. It's weird how similar this trial is with the X trial because the attorney that uh, Diedrich Williams had like got Drake involved and all these people that X ever beefed with that were like irrelevant to X's murder. It's weird how similar that is. There's no drop pins for an emergency pickup from any of those individuals. There's no phone for any of them at any of the scenes in this case. So here's the motive one. Anger, argument with Williams and Jamie King, greed. 16 million split between them four. What would be so wrong about that? Four million apiece. You tell me they couldn't be happy with that. 16 million split between four CEOs or just him and Corlin Henry. It was not 16 million though. That's cap. Ellie did not make $16 million. The 16 million is for all his managers, other clients that uh, 100K track had. Simple math, playing something four ways or two ways that Mr. Henry, who wasn't smart enough to even properly give a statement to keep Mr. Jennings away from the car. And each and every one shows how this case has been brought together. And he was the one that fired the fatal shots that killed Christopher Thomas and Anthony Williams. And you know that because even if you choose to disbelieve one part of the evidence, two parts of the evidence, you can see what the overall picture is. The overall picture puts Mr. Jennings in the backseat of that Jeep. It puts him holding a gun. You don't need a murder weapon to know that he committed these two crimes. If you serve justice, that you deliberate, and that you return a verdict of guilty as charged as to murder in the first degree. Thank you. She's like, damn, that was a lot. <laughs> Holy shit, was that intense, dude. She did a good job, though. She really laid it out because each minute that went on with her closing argument, it got worse for Melly. <laughs> I don't think the motive was the best. The trajectory and the angles of the shooting, the phone data. Oh, it's such a bad look. Oh, man. All right, now Melly's lawyer is going to come up. This is a big, big part for him right here, boys. This is his life right here in his lawyer's hands. Is he a principal? Or a shooter. That's what the state addressed you folks just a few moments ago before you went to lunch. And the reason they said that is because they don't even know. Otherwise, they would select. Where is the fire? They say it refers to guns. My interpretation, based upon the evidence, is where's the weed? The marijuana. Oh. FYE is definitely guns, not weed. I used to work at five below, but now I keep that five below. The, the burden now I keep that five below. Proof is on the state going to determine this young man's fate. And they come in here and give you alternatives. They come in here and give you their interpretation when we don't have to do a darn thing. And that principle was so important that his honor read you that instruction at the beginning when you were. So it's nice that they're interpreting these things. But the bottom line is, they don't even know. Because they've given you just two alternatives. Either he's the shooter or the principal. Make up your mind. I or any of the other individuals have done anything to irritate you. Don't take it out on this young man. They have the police department of Miramar. They have the Broward Sheriff's Office. They have the DNA labs. They have experts, the FBI. Everything at their disposal. And we have interrupted your lives for, it seems, like months. And we have put a horrible burden on your personal lives, your family life, and what? And all of us applaud your thank you. For your service. It is to the evidence introduced in this trial. And how does a reasonable doubt occur? From the evidence itself, conflict in the evidence, 
are lacking reasonable doubt from the evidence that has been presented that there is a conflict in the evidence. The medical examiner said it's unusual because normally you can't tell what shot occurred first, second, or third. They said that Matt Melly is a talented music artist. We agree with that based upon the evidence. He was making more money than probably everybody in this court, including us. Cortland Henry changed his clothes before he went to the hospital. That's what they said just 10 minutes ago. Number three, that there is absolutely no eyewitness that will implicate this young man to this crime. He's on camera walking into the fucking seat. Number four, they talk about premeditation. I suggest to you there, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever to show premeditation. And the last one that we absolutely agree with, and they admit it, the Miramar Police Department lacks the training. Those aren't my words. That was Miss Bradley just an hour ago. Not only did Miss Bradley say that, but Sergeant Williams, over 100 exhibits, sitting right here on the floor. Miss Bradley made reference to some of them. They're all here that this is a smoke screen. I suggest to you that this is open for anybody to interpret any way they want what this case is. And that's all this evidence is. That's not evidence proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Lee's talking mainly about the messages there. Showing the two cars and the eight individuals that left. It's a broken cell phone that Moretti could not tell you whose it was. And the 9807 phone that Melly uses, as other people do too. These are the two key pieces of evidence. These are what I suggest you focus in on. Because you can take any one of these items, any one of these text messages, any one of these pinging on, on maps, and you still don't know what was said, what was meant, and more importantly, who said it? I leave my phone, and I'm sure you all, in the house, and my wife picks it up and sends a message that there's a conflict in the testimony, that there is a lack of testimony. We learned immediately that that jeep was taken to a secure area, and it was searched for over 15 hours by two crime scene technicians, projectiles, I think a can, everything, and photographed the, the vehicle. Now, why is that important? That vehicle was searched again months later, but it didn't stop there because about three years later, miraculously, even though it was searched for hours by crime scene technicians, Sergeant Williams comes into the scene at the request of the state of Florida, and miraculously, he finds additional evidence, two projectiles and a bloodstain that obviously everyone else missed. That should tell me something about the quality of this investigation. He's not wrong there. I agree with him. The investigation was definitely sloppy on the Miramar side, but does it change the mountain of evidence, even if it's circumstantial? Not really. Knew where this young man lived along with all the other seven people. Cortland Henry lied to the police. Why in the heck don't you get a search warrant for the house? Why in the heck don't you? Don't tell us we didn't know where he lived. Don't tell us it was months later because they go into the car four years later. So why don't you do it? But let's go into the 11 witnesses now. The first one, and they mentioned it, the manager, that's the head guy of the gun and tool mark unit of the entire Broward Sheriff's Office. That can you tell or determine the distance between the shooter and the victim. Can you tell us that with all your experience? And what does he say? I can't do it. Unless I have the weapon, unless I have the ammunition, because ammunition, the weight of ammunition would change, the, could change the distance. Who comes in here four or five years later and says, I can tell you where shooter one was, and I can tell you who the shooter is. You talk about a conflict in the testimony. It's one or the other. It can't be both. This FBI agent, Brendan Collins. He is an expert in tracking phone. His expert. I cannot determine precisely the location of a phone. I cannot say 100% the phone is in, and you saw the band, it looks like a banana. I think it's somewhere within this area, but I can't be 100% sure. And he further tells you that the call detail records are limited, and I can't tell you who has a phone at any particular time. The phone data is a good premise, you can understand, but obviously it's not precise down to like exact location. It's just accurate in a general like area of a football field. So that's basically what they need to get across is there could be some doubt there, but why was his phone within a football field of the victim's phones? It's just so sus. The next witness I think you need to pay particular attention to. Exactly. And really get a flavor of what this case is all about. Is Felicia Holmes. Felicia Holmes oh boy. tells you that the Miramar detectives, Moretti and his group, threatened her, bullied her, bullied her daughter, potential witnesses, they were going to prison, told witnesses that they may never see their children again, told a witness that he was going to be deported, even though he's been in this country since five years old. He was going to be deported to Haiti where they won't feed you. It's such a bad look for detectives, but I'm sure this happens a lot in the United States. This is the, the great detective. This is why this kid's sitting here. They have intimidated and threatened everybody to consider Felicia Holmes because that tells you what's going on. This young man, this little kid, excuse me for calling him a kid, he was 19 at the time, was a rap star making more money than he'll ever see in his entire career at 19. And he wanted to nail this kid. And what better way to move up the ranks? Get some publicity? 
That's why he ignored everything, intimidated and threatened anybody. Kurt Rhodes, the DNA expert. Now, why is he important? While we were picking a jury, this prosecutor asked him to go back to the car and, and check some DNA. Now, why would you do that? The case, according to Moretti, is closed as soon as this young man is arrested. Why do you go back five years and ask an expert, a DNA expert, to do some more testing? This kid walked into the Broward, voluntarily surrendered. And five years later, they had the audacity to say, ah, to do a little more testing. Definitely very strange that they were doing a lot of shit last minute, like the DNA testing and the helicopter ride. And I would imagine they were just trying to build a stronger case because anything can happen at trial. If you want to be successful in rap music, you are going to pick up some of the nuances of various games. Snoop Dogg, to this day. Hold on, he's bringing up Snoop Dogg, what? Snoop Dogg, to this day, does hand signs of a game. And he does that because he realizes it promotes his music. You saying Snoop Dogg not about that life? I think Snoop Dogg was about that life like 20 years ago, 25 years ago or some shit, but not anymore. I don't think that's Snoop Dogg's mindset, but it's a good try. He wants to promote his music, make money. He's all of a sudden this big gang. Guy. Well, there's messages of him calling people Herc and messaging like five blood gang members who are getting mad at him for not responding, so. And they show you some text messages from, I think it was Gino, Herc, Wando Wando, who fought with. The Quando Wando? Already has no idea who Gino is, no idea who Herc is and doesn't know about Wanda Wanda. This is a great investigation. But they also he also refers to some text messages where those individuals that are in fact associated with the gang text him and he's not responding. And to the point of not responding, they say they're gonna put you on the plate. Now that's not for dinner. That's not for breakfast. We learned what that means. They're gonna have you killed. Why wouldn't you investigate this? They want you to believe that oh, there's no evidence of that. How do they know there's no evidence? If they don't investigate all these phones, yeah, Gino and Herc, you have to, their text messages, go get their phone. The presumption of innocence stays with us during the entire trial until and if they can prove beyond every reasonable doubt that this young man did anything wrong. That the first shot to Williams and Thomas were fatal. Thomas's injury to his hand came first. It was a defensive wound. We know that couldn't happen based upon the medical testimony. Special agent, FBI agent Collins, and two medical examiners conflict with Williams' testimony that you should take William's testimony and ignore it, toss it out. You can't have it both ways. And tell him that he's going to live life in the state penitentiary without parole or being on death row. This is the investigation they want you to rely upon and say it's proof beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Some of the investigation was definitely bad. He doesn't go to Applebee's to check yeah. their surveillance tape or the bank on Miramar Parkway to check their surveillance tapes. He doesn't go to the fire station to check their tapes, surveillance tapes. Oh, he boy. knows it. How do you know it if you don't check it? How do you know something unless you investigate? You look at all this and say, heck, man, 100 exhibits, 500 photographs out of a cell phone, all these text messages. What does it mean? Hopefully, for the state, you'll say, hey, where there's smoke, there must be fun. And say, hey, too bad, young man, too bad. There's a lot of stuff sitting here, and hopefully you will not fall into that trap. Trevion Glass, the individual who got into the red Mitsubishi, convicted of two felonies. Now, why is that important? Trevion Glass, the state called, as their star witness, basically say, Melly never got into that red Mitsubishi. And he told you one interesting thing. This is important right here because he's trying to sit on Trayvon Glass's testimony about Melly never getting in that car, so. And he doesn't want to go back to jail. Now, who has the authority to put him in jail? We don't. Who could put him back in jail? And that's the state of Florida, whether it be through the state attorney's office or the police department. And he miraculously is the only one that says no one got into the red Mitsubishi. Kind of a good point. Jameson Francois. And certainly you asked him, how long have you had this phone? And he says, I never asked him. Hm. How convenient. That's them hinting that Jameson Francois had the phone the entire time, which is just unrealistic, but whatever. Get a warrant for that phone. He's got warrants on every, a lot of phones. Get a warrant on that phone if you want to see what it is. It'll ruin the investigation. No reason, I think, was the exact quote, for the Jeep to stop on the side of the road. The reason was because he needed a bathroom break, just like you and I did when I raised my hand or stand up. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, if he needed a bathroom break in the dark highway and you saw him carry it in the, his hand, he'd leave it on the seat of the car. And we know that the car sped up because there was another car like the red Mitsubishi. The poor kid had to take, had to urine, and the phone was in the car. But they don't want you to know any of this. He's saying that the reason why the car stopped was that Melly had to take a piss and he left his phone in the car in the middle of the dark road and then they sped off for whatever reason. I've definitely done that, teenager or whatever, in high school and I have to fucking piss. I'm with a group of friends. Someone wants to get out and pee real quick on the side of the road. Yeah, it's definitely happened before. 
like mm-hmm. a drunken night. It's definitely a possibility. Every time I ever did that, they would like take their phone with them to like use the flash. Like I would want to see what the fuck is around me if I'm peeing on the side mm-hmm. of the street. I would have my flash out. Ask yourself, hey, keep telling me to use your common sense. Use your common sense, please. Ask yourself why a lead detective of a double homicide would not ask Jameson Francois, where the hell are the guns? Where the hell are the, the, the locks that belong to the guns? Where are they? Because, God forbid, those, or one of those, could be the murder weapon. The investigation of this rap star is down the tubes. Get up here, State, and tell why you didn't search the house. You learn about Frito Bang, supposedly. Supposedly takes him somewhere. Why in the heck don't you search his house? Even if it's four months later, five months later, ten months later, and use that fancy spray. They did absolutely nothing once they got that surveillance tape. Blinders on. We're not going to look to the left. We're not going to look to the right. We're just going to direct everything to this young man. You heard about Crucial Almighty, David Hedgehog, who wrote and text, we killed two of you. And in that message, he had a target over someone's face. Whose was it? Guess what? It's Melly. And he did it within hours. And what did they do? Nothing. He's the manager who had $16 million. If anyone had a motive, it would be Janice and Francois, possibly. That is required before you ask 12 of you that either put him on death row or life in prison. Why don't want him? Why don't you check him out? He's going to be on a plate. They're going to kill him. Ready to says, I don't even know who the heck Gino is because no one told me. Because I was woken up when someone was crawling in the back seat. How do I know that? When we got to Melly's house, he's the one who had to open the door because only he and Cortland Henry had the key. They told you that they would prove each element of this case. What they have proved to you is that Cortland Henry is involved in this case. Who else? If anyone else, you folks don't know. They tell you... <laughs> and play you a video where Melly appears, Cocoa Beach, that afternoon. Well, as AD told you, there was a contract. And people were gonna lose a lot of money. And he happens to be at the tender age at that time of 19, a professional. Other than at the tender age of 19, this kid, said kid, I shouldn't say that. This man, young adult, is a professional. They say because he didn't show up at one or two jobs, that well, what the heck. They have no idea what the contract was, especially when you're talking about a 19, you know, 23, 24 year old kid. Man, young adult, to be the kid. The worst thing you could do is sit and see on this justice. And we have sat here for months, starting in April. And I suggest to you right now, you should have more questions than when you were selected as church. God, I know she's probably so nervous. And check off. Count one. We, the jury, find as following to the defendant. Not guilty. We, the jury, on count two, find the defendant not guilty. You may think you might be involved. That's not enough. If you waver and vacillate, that's what reasonable doubt is all about. This is Fucking crazy. I feel like Netflix gonna make a TV show on this for sure. There's only mm-hmm. one just for it based upon the evidence it could be. they present. Maybe. Because there's a lack of evidence. There is a conflict in the evidence. And the evidence itself. And the investigation itself. Stinks. Overall, I feel like the prosecutor did a little bit better than the defense, like a little bit better and like laying out everything. I feel like he was a little bit jumbled. He was trying to defend a lot of points, could have got a little confusing to keep track of and all that. But I feel like the prosecutor was a little bit more organized, concise. But fuck, dude, it's a coin flip. Like, we don't know what this jury's thinking. I I truly believe this is a coin flip. But now we have the rebuttal of the prosecutor here. She gets a short rebuttal, I believe. So let's get it. Apple phone charger going to the back seat right there, not an LG. And also, ladies and gentlemen, you know, that LG phone wasn't working on October 26th of 2018. So let's be very clear on that. Let's talk about Adrian Davis. That assumes that Adrian Davis's testimony is consistent with every other sworn statement, deposition, and trial testimony in this case. If the witness is not credible and doesn't agree with any other piece of evidence in the case, Anthony Williams, is the back door unlocked? Yeah. What about this one? Where Mr. Jennings is asking, oh, does Bork have the garage button? More than one way to get into a house. Of course, she said more than one way to get in the house. That was kind of a big point for the defense was saying that only Melly and Bortland had keys to the house. Between Davis had a key. There's no question based on these messages. Say that a man who spent 20 years in armed services, protection, and furtherance of his country cares about publicity. There was no impeachment. There was no articles or news things on that. No. Detective Moretti is here fighting on behalf of Christopher Thomas and Anthony Williams. Calling someone a kid, anything like that, is a play on your sympathy. And ladies and gentlemen, you agree when we sat down for jury selection, that sympathy would not come into play. And the only person who had the opportunity, the reason, and the means is this defendant. He was playing on that sympathy pretty hard. Once the evidence is there as to each element of the offense, there is no longer presumption of innocence. There is no question as to what that picture shows. That this defendant committed two counts of first degree murder. Not once did he mention anything about a key break. Never came up. Could have testified. Well, that's a good point. Adrian Davis never said anything about a pee break, but he, he did say he was asleep. Phones don't send messages and walk 1,300 steps by themselves. 
what the evidence does show, the defendant was consistently in that Jeep, and that Jeep never stopped during that whole course of travel. As you heard, ladies and gentlemen, that DNA was collected October 26th of 2018. That's a new point that I, I guess I missed. That's a big point. I thought that they collected the DNA four years later. They just tested it later on. Definitely not a good look for Melly, but we all saw him on camera already get in the car. Of course, there's going to be some DNA on that door handle, but you know. Beyond a reasonable doubt, Janelle Dennis has committed two counts of first degree murder. Thank you. That's a mic drop if I've ever seen one right there, dude. A lot of things point towards that back seat. And who was in that back seat? Melly was, man. All right, that's pretty much it for the closing arguments. Now the jury decides wine to be Melly's fate. However long it takes, it's over for today on Thursday, but they resume tomorrow and Friday. I'm going to go live on this channel as soon as there's a verdict. I'll try to go live. I still think it's a coin flip. Maybe like a 30% chance he gets a not guilty vote. I don't know. We're in Paris, Kentucky, where 30-year-old Bass Webb has been charged with two counts of attempted murder. This surveillance video taken outside of Kentucky jail a week earlier captured the moment when Webb, a former inmate there who served three months on assault charges, accelerated his car and tried to run over two jail employees. One man was able to get out of the way, but one man was injured after Webb's vehicle pinned him against the wall. At his first court appearance before Judge Vanessa Dixon, Webb's bad behavior continued. Judge Dixon then informed Webb she's recusing herself from the trial because she knew the two jail employees he targeted with his vehicle. Watch again as Webb literally spit on the judge. But this incident is far from the last time Bass Webb will spit in the face of the law. While waiting to go to trial, he and four other inmates incited a riot inside the Fayette County Detention Center. After being shot with beanbag bullets, in the neck by a pepper ball. Webb whips a metal telephone box at a corrections officer. If I Bam. were to watch this at someone that's fucking huh. 10 feet away, because this is capable of stopping that does not mean that that is not readily capable causing death or serious physical injury. Webb was found guilty of third degree assault and sentenced to 15 years in prison. And for his attempt to run over the two jail employees, he was later found guilty of two counts of attempted murder and got an additional 37 years. Bass Webb was facing a total of 52 years behind bars but more disturbing accusations were on the way. While incarcerated, he was charged with the unsolved murder of an ex-girlfriend, facing a possible death sentence if convicted at trial. Damn.
Sorry about that technical difficulty we just had. Let me uh, re-add it. All right. He's not even a lawyer, but he is a co-plaintiff in a civil suit that Walters has filed against his former attorney. Blandino has earned a dubious reputation for filing frivolous motions and joining civil suits where he has no affiliation. But Judge Herndon is not about to let Blandino disrupt his courtroom. Okay, you're, are you an attorney? No, not then you're no. then you need to sit down and quit staring at me like somehow you need to talk to me or whatever. I do need not, to. Pardon? Can I make a record? No. Okay. I'm going to make a record about you in a minute, but you need to sit down and be quiet because you're not a, a plaintiff or a defendant in my criminal case. You're not an attorney. You can't appear in my criminal case and act like an attorney. So sit down and be quiet. Mr. Thank Walters, you. go ahead. Walters continues, but when Blandino physically reacts to Judge Herndon's comments, the judge has a few choice words for him and his habit of acting like an attorney. Uh, you know what? Let me tell you something. You want to act like an asshole, act like an asshole, but I'm telling you, that gets you nowhere in court. And you know what else gets you nowhere in court? Sitting in the audience of a court while a judge is engaging with somebody and shaking your head and being all demonstrative. So get out. I'm sorry, it was inadvertent. I'm... No, it wasn't inadvertent. Don't give me that. It's not inadvertent. It's never, get out. It's never inadvertent when you come in and act all disrespectful to people. Blandino exits, but feeling disrespected, he later files a motion to have Judge Herndon disqualified from the case. The motion was denied. Sin Vetter versus Kim Dennis Blandino. 18 months later, Blandino's back in court, but this time as a defendant. That ain't good. He's been charged with extortion and is under oh. house arrest. He has a hearing before Judge James Bixler, who's well aware of Blandino's history as a wannabe litigator. Oh, it's a different judge. Blandino's representing himself. Thought it was the same judge. The court has appointed Steve Alter as co-counsel, which puts Blandino in a combative mood. Mr. Alder, will you accept appointment as standby counsel? I have an objection. Shut up. I have a right to object, I believe, Your Honor. You have the right to get held in contempt of court. And that's what's going to happen if you don't shut up. I'm not putting up with any of your crap here today. Your reputation has preceded you. Uh-oh. Will you accept appointment on him as, as standby counsel? Your Honor, I can. However, Mr. Flandino, uh, after he spoke outside, wanted a little bit of time to speak to me in detail about his case and his desires, and then also to look into my background a little bit before he would read. He wants to interview you? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, your honor. I object to that laughing, Judge. I object to you. Oh! Ho, 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 ho. I think the defendant has already categorized himself as a vexatious litigant. Uh, I, I object. You can shift all you want. Can I make a record? No. I've got a, I've got a motion. What did I just say? Though. What did I just say? No. I can't say anything. No. From the whole point he's been in here, this is not going to look good on the judge. Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't. Blandino refuses to quit to the point where others in the courtroom begin reprimanding him. Shut up. Shut up. You're getting real close to getting remanded. Blandino finally gets the message and agrees to meet with the court appointed counsel. Okay, okay. Bye bye bye. Okay. okay. Thank you. I think you're very impatient, sir. <laughs> Blandino remained under house arrest for extortion and impersonating a public officer. We've all heard of a judge throwing the book at someone for their crimes, but you're about to see a judge who's throwing a book for a whole different reason. Lawyers and a judge are trying to select a jury, a critical step in ensuring a fair trial. The defendant is Jose Azuzena, who's charged with 40 counts. Yeah, just give him the death penalty. Counts of sexual misconduct, including kidnapping, rape of a minor oh 
It's day two of jury selection, and Asuzena's attorney is interviewing a prospective juror who sits off camera. The judge listens on. So can you be fair to both sides? I think I would be biased. You're off this jury, no, no, no. but you didn't say that yesterday. It looks like the judge has taken issue with a potential juror. Well, I said right. I had no, listen, person. but what we're not going to have in this jury is people coming in overnight and thinking up <laughs> and trying to make it up now so they can get out of the jury. That's not going to happen, all right? Because right? if I find if someone says something yesterday under oath and changes it because they're trying to fabricate something and get out of serving on this jury, there's going to be repercussions. The judge is unsatisfied and demands an explanation. What's going on here? Tell I me what's so. going on. I said I had other issues yesterday, and you said you'd get back to me. All right, so, so why do you got issues? Why can't you, you're, you're saying that you can't be fair and impartial to both sides. You're going to completely throw out our entire justice system because you don't want to be fair and impartial. Disgusted with the juror, who happens to be a nurse, the judge throws a book which turns out to be a pocket-sized version of the U.S. Constitution against the wall. Things are heating up, so attorneys attempt to intervene. Your Honor, may we approach? Your Honor, we can't approach. You're not going to be fair and impartial. Like I said, with my nursing history, and I've been involved with child abuse, and I've been involved with incest with young girls that deliver 13 years old, uh, it makes me rather, you know, biased. Ma'am, you're, you're off this jury. You're off this jury. You're removed. Go home. All right? The nurse is excused from jury duty, not before the judge gets in one last remark. I don't like your attitude. The case against Asuzena eventually makes it to trial, and he's found guilty. He's sentenced to life in prison, but that's not... Oh, we're going to warehouse him where the story ends. You're saying that you can't be fair and impartial to both sides. The Nevada Supreme Court overturns the conviction, claiming... Oh, my God. This is what can go wrong when a judge gets all high and mighty. I mean, they're answering the question he asked. You know, is there anything you think that could prevent... You know... So she's answering the question, and he's mad at the answer. Judge Scotty created, and as a result, an intimidating environment, which tainted the jury panel. Asuzan is awarded a new trial and a new judge. Until then, he remained in custody. Although Scotty apologized. Well, I mean, still, he's still being warehoused, and he'll probably be found just as much guilty as the first time. But it's just a waste of taxpayer money. Apologize for the incident. His outburst resulted in ethics charges, courtesy of the Nevada Commission of Judicial Discipline. You're removed. Go home. All right? I don't like your attitude. We head to Orlando, Florida. Jeremy DeWitt, the very famous police impersonator. The defendant is 39-year-old Jeremy DeWitt. He's been charged with him. Also is a sexual offender. Personating a police officer. DeWitt runs a company that provides private security escorts during funeral processions. This dude has been on Dr. Phil, everything he is. Uh, I, I don't know, but I'll tell you one thing. He has gotten favor after favor after favor by the judicial system. Uh, his own younger brother showed up to a sting in one of his company's uniforms trying to have sex with a mom. His own brother was charged with, you know, trying to meet up with a minor. And Jeremy, oh. Jeremy was charged with a sexual crime in the late 90s. And you know what else he was charged with? Personating a police officer in the late 90s. Right before the bridge, you so he goes through all that court process stuff, gets out of jail, somehow is able to come up and create this company, get all these vehicles, start a funeral procession, which lets him live out the fantasy even more that he wants to be a police officer. Get the light after the bridge. 
it's a legitimate business that DeWitt is authorized to operate. Get to me, get to me. But he's not authorized to act like a cop, which he does. He gets me. What he's not authorized to do is direct traffic. Go past me. Go past me. Repo, take this intersection and keep this shit under control. Weave through traffic at illegal speeds. It's still 110 down this road. Oh. Confessed on his own body cam. Or most notably, pull over. Hey! Pull over! Pull over! Outright. And confront drivers while dressed somewhat like a real officer. What are you doing? What the f does it look like I'm doing, dumb? F Get the f over before you find out. Stop pretending you're a police officer. Listen, my I know what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. What you need to do is figure it the f out before you start talking. F With such blatant behavior, the local media gets wind of what Dewitt is up to. Before long, he appears on the radar of the real police. And in 2019, after police observed him breaking traffic laws, he's arrested while working a funeral. Who is this guy? Jeremy DeWitt. Oh, that's Jeremy right there? When officers questioned DeWitt about the registration of his motorcycle, which comes up as stolen, he becomes livid. I'm Sergeant, my vehicle's not stolen, Sergeant. I can tell you right now, everything's being videotaped on my body cam, Sergeant. Okay, you're, you're so, I have the registration. Here, here's here's here. Sergeant. Officers search DeWitt and find an arsenal of police gear, including handcuffs, mace, and a baton. Because the Honda was stolen, and we got the tag cap from the Orange County Sheriff's Office, and then we registered it to that motorcycle. But as DeWitt loudly attempts to explain the situation, In the car, dude. officers have had enough. You just chill. If it's, a, if it's an issue, we'll, we'll figure it out. But you screaming and yelling isn't going to change that. Well, just sit tight. Okay. DeWitt's charged with impersonating an officer and released on bond. But while out on bond, police get a warrant for DeWitt's own body camera and find a wealth of incriminating footage, including more pullovers. Get the f over! And additional confrontations with drivers DeWitt considers interfering in his escorting a funeral procession. Hi! How are you today? good how are you you must have missed that it's 45 through there and then you use the turning lane to cut through traffic yep. i understand you're in a nice car and everything but let's be a little nice more car, mature the way you drive it. let's nice drive car. the right are way you, then are you a cop don't worry about what i am because oh, no. i'm a state agent so yeah, well, what you need not. to do is make sure you're doing the right thing boy the driver pulls away it doesn't take too long for dewitt to catch up yeah yeah, I know. The way you almost hit me, boy, oh, yeah, is the way it's professional, you're bitch ass. You're not a cop. You want to fight? You're violating the rule, too. How's you're that? Even act like you're stopping me. I didn't pull you over. Thing. Did I make a traffic no. on you, boy? No. Come on, let's go, bitch. DeWitt's arrested again and brought before the judge with two more charges of impersonating an officer. You were arrested pursuant to a probable... Just throw him away, too. Cause warrant for falsely impersonating an officer. Once again, is released on bond. Thank you. How? How? Yes. Revoke the bond. Turns out DeWitt has quite a history of playing cop. He was convicted of the same charge back in 2001. But DeWitt can't seem to stay out of trouble. And after multiple arrests for impersonating an officer, He's back in court again. Your name, sir? I'm sorry, Jeremy Charles, Your Honor. This time, he's not here for being a fake police officer, but for failing to register a vehicle as a very real sex offender. In 2005, DeWitt was convicted of lewd or lascivious battery involving a victim between 12 and 15 years old. Hi, Mr. DeWitt, you're here today because you're arrested on uh, an arrest warrant for... Uh, a sex offender uh, violation failing to register as required. Uh, you're also out on bond on five charges of falsely uh, impersonating an officer. The state is requesting his bonds be revoked uh, on his prior cases, giving the new law violation continued pattern of criminal activity. Yes. He also poses a flight risk. The prosecution again asks that his bond be revoked. 
But once again, DeWitt catches a break. No, <laughs> I'm going to leave the bonds in place. Why? As for his remaining impersonation charges, until his trial begins, DeWitt remains free on bond. I think he got 18 months, Next which is crazy considering he got charged with it five times, but they might have overcharged him. I don't know. Tampa, Florida, for a Zoom court hearing. All right. So we're here on State of Florida versus Jennifer Carvajal. The 24 year old's facing serious charges, including DUI manslaughter after a passenger in her car was killed and two others severely injured in a high speed car. Whoa. Car accident. This police dash cam video shows the car driven by Carvajal traveling at 111 miles per hour on a that's arrestable. Florida Highway. After clocking her speed, the officer hits the lights and begins the pursuit. Down the freeway, he catches up, but as he closes in to pull Carvajal over, she whips the car onto the shoulder and then skids out of control. Damn! Shit. Down the freeway, he catches up, but as he closes in to pull Carvajal over, she whips the car onto the shoulder and then skids out of control. Dude, she got that. That's at least a car and a half length of air she got. Holy shit. And then hit in the front and flipped over. Holy shit. How did she live? Right, a second camera on the officer's cruiser shows Carvajal's car speeding off the highway and hitting an embankment, sending it airborne. After flying over a fence, the car crash lands into a car dealership lot, hitting a parked truck. I started to say it looked just like a car lot. And then a light pole. At the scene, emergency personnel discover the two passengers were ejected from the car. Oh my God. Another was seriously injured inside. And Jennifer Carvajal, the only one wearing a seatbelt, had just minor injuries. Her blood alcohol level was later recorded at 0 0.10, slightly above the 0 0.08 legal limit. One of the passengers thrown from the car, Carvajal's 22-year-old cousin, did not survive. Let's take a moment of silence for that victim. Wow. Amen, amen. Now at the hearing, Judge Catherine Kaplan will determine if Carvajal should continue to be held without bond. So Ms. Carvajal, on the one count of DUI manslaughter that still did not have a bond on it, I'm going to uh, grant the state's motion for pretrial detention and hold you without bond on that one count. Part of the state's recommendation to hold Carvajal in custody Maybe because this is not the first time she's faced a DUI manslaughter charge. The entire situation... You gotta be kidding me. ...is a horrific flashback to seven years earlier when, at 16, Carvajal pleaded no contest to a charge of DUI manslaughter in an adult court and faced sentencing two years later after she turned 18 years old. have a moment of silence again for those victims wow
Hey man, I, I tell you what, this is crazy. Carbajal was sentenced to five years in prison with an additional five years of probation. So she, so she just got off that, or is she still on it? She's still on it. Of course, don't let her out. If she just got off of it, she obviously didn't learn, so don't let her out. Probation <laughs> that was still in effect when the second incident occurred. Oh no, she was still on probation for that part. Great. In addition to having Carbajal. I'm being sarcastic. All held without bond, the state then makes another request. The state is requesting that the defendant be ordered um, not to make contact with either of the two living victims or to the mother of the deceased victim, in this case, Pedro Carvajal, um, and his mother is present with us today, Your Honor. Wow. Pedro Carvajal and the victim's mother can be seen wiping away tears as the family tragedy and no contact order is discussed. Because it's family, obviously some people with out of control on their own with good intentions just trying to check on people may very well run afoul of the unintentionally violating a court order, but it's not because of my clients directing anyone. It is going to be part of the order from today. So Ms. Pizarro, if you'll just add it to the written order so there's no confusion. Judge Catlin would approve the no contact order. Jennifer Carvajal was held without bond. The trial is currently pending. Okay, is everybody ready to listen to me? Next, we go to a child custody hearing in Las Vegas, Nevada. The plaintiff is Shelby Bachman. And the defendant, Jonathan King. The couple are arguing over visitation rights for their two-year-old son, Joseph. The issue is King's unpredictable work schedule. The attorneys are Don Procopius, and for the defense, Chancy Kramer. Because my client is a UPS driver, his schedule, though, is not a set schedule. It varies. So he has to keep her notified of when his schedule is changing so that she's aware of pickup. She has told him now if he's more than half an hour late, he forfeits his entire weekend and can't see the kid. Has Joseph gone weekends that he would have expected to see his father without seeing his father? He has not missed one weekend. Not, not one. The threat was made. Not I didn't one. ask you if the threat was made. I asked if it happened. You led me to believe that it was happening. No. My client has worked with him at times that, that it was till Saturday morning that he there, there is a problem yeah. here. After hearing from both sides, Judge Sandra Pomerenz points to the lack of cooperation between the parents. What I see here is parties not being creative. But these two need to be adult enough to say, okay, this happened, where do we go from here? But Your Honor, and I agree with you. And so what she's done is on these times where she's worked with him, but then I think it was within the last two weekends. I thought you said you agreed with me. I do agree with you. Okay, so that listen time. to me. You're not gonna be, you're gonna be done with this case when this case is over and these parties are divorced. They'll never be done with this case, okay? So rather than complaining to me, it's a discussion with Mr. Prokofiev being creative. It appears the judge has struck a nerve with the defense. My client has come up with all kinds of solutions, Your Honor, and it, it comes down to what mom wants is what mom is going to demand. Okay, I don't buy that. Well, Your Honor, that's how it what is. I, what I'm telling you is, have you discussed this issue with Mr. Prokofiev? Yes, I have in the hallway. Okay. And has it been a matter of making demands or saying, what are we going to do? No, it's a matter it's of calling a my matter. client a Things begin to get personal, and the judge has a few words for Kramer. I do have experience with you using inappropriate language. And you know that I would admit it if I had done it. And if I was going to do it, I would have done it to her face. You know what? You want to be a sailor, fine. Go be a sailor in your private life. But don't be a sailor in my court or in my cases. I didn't. Again, I don't judge people with sailor language because I use a little sailor language, but only in my private life, not in my courtroom, not to a, a litigant, not to an attorney. I don't do that because that's not professional. And ma'am, I warn you, one of these days, the state bar is going to catch up to that. Because if you read the rules, there is an ethical rule about fairness to opposing counsel. I know that there are also rules about treating people equally without regard to race, ethnicity, or gender. 
I find it highly objectionable that anyone complains about my language because I know all kinds of male attorneys who have no problem picking up the phone and screaming cuss words at me. So if I am outside there where my First Amendment rights are in full effect, I will say what I choose to say when I choose to say it, and that is my right in this country. Are you good? But after a few minutes of civility, the counselor starts up again. We've spent, what, five, ten minutes talking about nothing that is relevant to this case because I, as a female attorney, am being chastised over language that men feel free to use every single day, and they do. You are giving me a headache because you're yelling, and I don't like having No, I'm being attacked, Your Honor. No, you're not. Sit down, counsel. I'm done hearing from you. Unsatisfied with the party's solutions, the judge orders an evidentiary hearing, which means the parents will submit evidence against each other and the judge will make a ruling. In a child custody case, it can get ugly. Your lawyers are going to be painting a picture for me in court. And it's not going to be a great picture of either one of you about the other. Even after the judge makes her decision, the defense tries one last argument. You are. I have nothing more to say, and I want to want to hear from other either one of you. I'm going to set the trial. I understand that. So sit down. The couple's evidentiary hearing is postponed multiple times, and has yet to be heard. Mm. Now to Durham, North Carolina. Where These are 2021, so they're a little. Judge old. James Hill is presiding over a child custody case. For three long days. Divorced parents Rashauna and Colin Morrison have been going at it quite personally in the courtroom. I'm angry that his dad lives in Durham, can go on vacations with friends, take mistresses out to eat, take her on vacation, and can't seem to see his son. The child's mother, Rashauna, claims her ex-husband abandoned their three-year-old son and failed to pay child support. He argues she withheld his son from him and is seeking permanent custody. And the judge? Well... He isn't happy with either of them. I could care less about it than you. I could. The two of you are not important. And he's about to let them know it. That two parents, and I'm going to choose my words very carefully here. Two parents can come in and act like such idiots. No one would have crawled into bed and had sex and made that baby. He didn't ask to be born. But he was. What's important is and we don't mean to see two adults acting like idiots. Did I say the word idiots? He did. Three times. Afterward, Judge Hill turns his attention towards Rashauna. I have no doubt that you have withheld that little boy. Don't, don't you look at me. I have not. You say one more word, you, get, you say one more word, you're going to go to the dirt guy's bed breakfast today. You say one more word. All right. Now she's got 24 hours to get the court. We're running her back as soon as we get done. All right, you got 48 hours. You will say it again. She's got 48 hours. Wow. <laughs> Roshana eventually quiets down, and finally, after three heated days in the courtroom, the judge delivers his decision. Both parents are fit and proper persons have custody of my child. I'm in a joint custody. Just take me I can't do this. This is a disgrace. What you guys are doing, you need to let your son for five months. Don't take care of him. You're a drunk. You have a mistress. You have a mistress. As officers try to restrain her, Morrison's brother, Sherrod Smith, comes forward from the back of the courtroom. At first, he tries to help by calming down his sister. But when that doesn't work, and Roshana throws a bail off a right hook, Big Brother's caught in the middle. Officers try to restrain him, but he sends one of them flying. Meanwhile, the judge makes a quick exit. As one deputy fights to gain control of Morrison, another puts her brother in handcuffs. 
And here come even more officers to shut things down. Sorry to say that panic button ain't working as quick. Stop yelling at me. I'm a woman. Stop manhandling me. You just threw a right hook at a deputy. As Morrison and Smith are taken away, a third... That woman fucking privilege shit. Because they think us men have privilege. Yeah, we got privilege, all right. This person is also restrained in the back of the courtroom. Their mother. You should have videoed it. It's okay. Oh, they did. They videoed it all. Smith and his mother are hit with 48 hours in jail for resisting a public officer. That's pretty, like, lenient, too. Just 48 Morrison hours in jail. And receives 30 days. Morrison and her husband now have a joint custody agreement. Judge she, she, didn't want, a she didn't want that, that father having joint custody because she didn't like how their relationship uh, went. And then he automatically had another woman in there and everything. And she says that he wasn't seeing his son. And maybe he wasn't. Maybe he wasn't. But that doesn't mean that that judge needs to give you full custody so you can. Because you're going to hold. Because judging by the way she was talking, she, she's going to hold that against him. She ain't never going to let him forget it. And she'll use that in the basis of her future decisions. So I'm actually glad that he awarded it joint custody public reprimand by the north carolina supreme court for improperly exercising his contempt powers failing to maintain order and decorum and making inappropriate comments i think they're wrong there meet the man in the fur cap 21 year old robert peterson he's the person oh my god and filming this footage he enters the Kootenai County Courthouse in Idaho. That has to go through the x-ray machine if you want to come in this building. Peterson is a hearing for a minor traffic infraction, riding his bicycle at night without a light. You gotta be kidding me. So you're going in there. You're not using... You're not going in there the way you think you're going in there. You're going in there looking like a buffoon with that fur hat on. It's not, it's not spiritual, religious, or any other type of headwear, but he's going to claim that it is, you know, and, and my fucking haters are probably saying, oh, you wore your spirit, well, exactly, my spiritual hat, or related to my beliefs, yeah, I did. But from the moment he steps inside the door, it's clear this won't be a typical security check. And I'd just like to know where your warrant is. It's clearly posted on the entry in the film. What? Clearly posted the I It's clearly posted. <laughs> Dude. Supreme Court's upheld this. Forfeit my right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure. It's not a search. I'm not a person. It's a search to get in the building. And more specifically, a free man. Peterson considers himself a sovereign citizen. I'm not subject to your jurisdiction, and uh, the court has already confirmed that. I'm here for one purpose. All right. You can, you can submit or you can leave. That's fine. I mean, I'll do that, but, but, but you will be charged a bill. Charged a bill? Rather than escalating. Go ahead and charge him his bill. Escalating the situation, one of the bailiffs decides to play along. You will be served a bill. I don't have any weapons. I didn't come here to raise a ruckus. After clearing security, Peterson finds a seat at the rear of the courtroom and continues filming. So there's no cameras in the court. Excuse me? There are no cameras in the court. Yeah, there is. No, you have to put that away. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Under what authority? There's a court, you have to have a court order from a judge before you can have a camera in the courtroom. Okay, well, I'm going to capture no, you this on video. you got to turn it off. It's for both. I don't agree with that. Protection. I mean, I don't agree with it, but then again, his way of going about getting it changed is not right either. Well, you have to turn off. No, thank you. Enter bailiff number two. Shut the camera off now. No, thank you. I do not consent to you touching me or seizing my property. So you, you need to shut back the up. camera off now. I'm not being, I'm not doing anything wrong. Yes, you I'm holding you accountable because you're about to overstep your bounds. 
<laughs> the bailiffs then decide to clear the courtroom and question Peterson directly. What's your first and last name? I don't have a last name. You don't have a last name? No. What's your first name? I don't have a first name either. I've got a name. My name is Robert. You can call me Robert. <laughs> He's seen this before. Robert. As you can see, this bailiff keeps his sense of humor about the situation. What are you? Are you human? I'm a man. You're a human? I'm a man, yes. I see your Idaho state license. No, I don't have one. You don't have one? My person does, but I don't. With the situation seemingly diffused, Come on in, folks. the bailiffs usher everyone back into the courtroom. Well, except for one person. <laughs> Excuse me. Camera. Excuse me. That is a Tennessee state. So he's in Tennessee court. You're blocking my freedom of movement. I am. All right. Well, P. Barnes. You, P. Barnes is about to go down as a legend. You just admitted to me that you're violating my rights. No, I'm not. You can't come in with the camera. Well, you're violating my rights. And this is also freedom, freedom of the press. Out. What about my right? What about my right? From behind you. This is also freedom of the press. I mean, I don't know what the hell law book you're reading, man. He, he, he took a playbook out of Johnny Goebbels. But it does. Let me just have this camera holding up where everybody can see it. Apply to me. Why are you worried about cameras? Because you want to do something against wrong? Because you want to do something wrong? Because if, if it's against the rules, that means it's because somebody intends on wronging somebody else. Because they're afraid of being held accountable. Pete Barnes. It's a nice speech, but you're still not coming in. <laughs> he said that's a nice speech, but you're still not getting in. Well... <laughs> I love how he looks back like, yeah, I'm about to do this. Step aside. I'm going in. No, you're not going in. Don't touch me. You're not. Uh, he's about to touch you with something else. I'm going in, sir. Let the record show. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, that you just battered me. Step Don't tase me, bro. Back. And you're using. Oh! Oh! Step back. After Peterson refuses to step back, Chief Bell of Pete Barnes fires his taser. And you're using. Oh! <laughs> and you're using. Oh! Ah! Ah, stop, please. I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah, you did. Hey, you know what? You guys are really overstepping your bounds right now. I think you've said that to him like about five times now. Put the cuffs on. What are you arresting me for? The answer to that question? Disorderly conduct. Peterson's charged with three. Contempt of court. One counts yeah. of battery and one count of contempt of court. He would later enter an Alford plea, meaning he didn't admit to committing a crime, but acknowledged there was likely enough evidence to convict him. Jail time was waived as part of... Oh, okay, so he didn't have it on. He just really quickly had to put it back on. The plea deal, he was ordered to pay a fine for his original charge... And it's not even winter. ...riding a bike at night without a light. <laughs> got the right i mean he's got some right things like he, he believes that cameras i'll be allowed in the courtroom print everybody I, I i believe i i get him i get it but then again it's foolish for some small stuff like that next we head to bentonville arkansas outside the courthouse defendants are being transported to the county jail including diego jose zayas martinez He's been charged with making terroristic threats and stabbing a man. He was just in court at his bond hearing, where his bail was set at $100,000. Watch as the deputy escorts the men to the bus. There's Zayas Martinez. Like the other defendants, he's wearing handcuffs. But his feet are free, so he decides to use them. Let's take a closer look. Zayas Martinez makes a break for it just beyond the grasp of the second deputy. And the officers immediately give chase. But one quickly stops, deciding to stay with the remaining prisoners. They're like, we ain't going nowhere. Zayas Martinez makes it to the parking lot. Damn, he getting little. Yeah, he getting little on his ass. He isn't far behind. Isn't far behind. One, two, three. Yeah, he's only four car lengths behind. He'll need to pick up the pace, though, if he wants to close the gap. Despite the deputy trying to head him off, Zayas Martinez manages to stay one step ahead. 
Looks like he's just hopped a fence. Damn. And with that, he could be home free. Determination. Not quite. Later that day, a sheriff's deputy gets some help from a concerned citizen who tells him the man he's after is hiding beneath her house. Zayas Martinez wow. is captured and taken back to the courthouse where his original Damn. bond is increased to $500,000 and he faces an additional charge of third-degree escape. You saw me swear firm to tell the truth, the whole truth. Well, this guy. Next, we're in Sylvan Lake, Michigan, for the deposition of 42-year-old David E. Taylor. The man on camera may look like just a regular guy, but to the followers of his multi-million dollar mega church, they believe he's truly holier than thou. Mr. Taylor, you also go by uh, the name of the Apostle? Yes. Why, wow, the Apostle? David Taylor claims he was personally visited by Jesus Christ and now brings others into the light through his nonprofit organization, Joshua Media Ministries International, or JMMI. Taking a play, play right out of L. Ron Hubbard and create his own religion. Today, Taylor's being deposed in a divorce case involving one of his volunteers, a woman who donated over a million dollars to his ministry. Damn! Now, as part of the divorce proceedings, lawyers want to know exactly how that money was used. On November 29th, 2013, JMMI paid over $6,000 to Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton? Mm -hmm. Yes. What would that be for? Well, this is for clothes concerning my TV ministry as well. June 2014, you spent $3,500 by JMMI to Versace in the Bahamas. Versace. Versace, 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 Versace. Well, that ain't something I purchase all the time. Um, no, it looks like you did several you know, times in... Uh, I mean, I, I'm a very frugal person when it comes to this. You I know, don't see Macy's. No, you don't see that, you know, because Macy's don't have the kind of suits that I wear. 2013 and 14, you spent over, JMMI spent over $30,000 in your clothes. Does that mm -hmm. sound about right? But what, what year was that? 13 and 14. Oh, God, yes, because I was traveling so much and ended up sweating through all my clothes. Exactly. It probably wasn't enough. Sweating through all my clothes. You gonna sweat through your clothes. What the fuck are you talking about? The hot seat gets hotter when Taylor's... I, damn, I wish I had so much money that, uh, you know, fuck, I sweated through this. You know, I sweated through something yesterday, uh, going through my taper. I mean, got into the damn thing, was fucking soaked when I woke up. And I had to sit there and stay soaked in it before I could get my mental fortitude and physical strength to get up out of the fetal position I was fucking in. And take the damn thing off. And you know what I did? I put it, I didn't put it in the trash can. I put it in the fucking wash, wash bin because it's going to be washed and I can put it back on again. What the fuck do you mean you sweating through your clothes? Question to damn, all right. So apparently every time you sweat through a shirt or something now, you're just supposed to throw it away and replace it with Louis Vuitton. I, I didn't fucking know. But the ministry's fleet of luxury cars. You testified at the chamber of mine. I'm just now getting the memo. He owns three vehicles, a BMW, a Mercedes, and a Bentley. Of course, not a Ford or a GMC or not. No, it's got to be a Mercedes, Bentley, and fucking whatever the last one was. Yes. I have a question. Just from our, you know, you minister the poor and the sick and all that. It, it does, exactly. Isn't it a little offensive to be driving around in a Bentley and a Mercedes to people that really, um, you know, are impoverished and sick? And donating their money to you. Ill. It could be offensive if they didn't know my life. And the it could be offensive if they didn't know my life. That was an answer or non-answer answer if I've ever heard one. The baptism by fire continues when he's asked about a two point eight million dollar mansion listed as a quote residential center by the ministry. All right. So Not what really. is this residential center? Oh, this is a. Um a place that the ministry owns 
well, not own, we are, we are in the process of buying that. All right, so where does the number 2,844,000 come from on your asset and liability? Appraise, uh, that's, I guess, the appraisal value of the home. Wait, the appraised value of what? That's, I guess the appraisal value of the home. The lawyer catches that Taylor refers to the property as a home. Is it a home? No, it's a residential center. While Taylor's deposition was just part of a divorce case, it would later come back to haunt him. After the more than three hour video was posted online, the ministry and Taylor himself came under fire as allegations of misused funds flooded the internet. Despite the negative publicity, David E. Taylor continues to spread his gospel around the world. Next, we go to a pretrial hearing in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Jeremy Shu, age 39. Home invasion, GTA, identity theft, possession of a controlled substance, all the late greatest hits. The first degree home invasion, car theft, identity theft, and possession of a controlled substance. The defendant arrives in a wheelchair after suffering a number of strokes over the years. That's Shu's attorney, Walter White. Walter White? Any other motions or preliminary matters? Breaking I bad in there? You state my previous request. Should have went with uh, Saul no, Goodman. Withdraw from the case. Should have went Since with Saul Goodman. just asked to be removed from the case. Mr. Shu and I have basically no communication. He prepares his own motions. He has asked me to file them. Uh, sometimes I have, sometimes I have not. He's had a series of strokes. I mean, he, uh, he's in a wheelchair. Even though Shu's in a wheelchair, not even his own attorney is sure about the severity of his condition. I don't know uh, what his physical health is, but I know that he's maybe not as strong as he used to be. And so I would just uh, ask your honor to consider allowing me to withdraw so that he can get an attorney that he can work with. I previously ruled on your motion to withdraw and nothing has changed in the interim, so I'll stand by that ruling. I'd like to represent myself then, Your Honor. That's right. If Shu can't have his way, then he'll just represent himself. Well, I would strongly urge you not to do that. Mr. White's been a criminal defense attorney for as long as I can remember. That's your opinion. I don't I don't buy your opinion. Well, that's fine. You don't have to buy my opinion, but he is a lawyer and you're not. I'm a better lawyer than you. Oh. That's your opinion as well. Oh shit. If you want to proceed and represent yourself, we can do that. Jury trial will be the 21st of January at 8.30. I need time to go through pre-trial motions. January 21 at 8.30. Mr. I haven't White. had no time to go through pre-trial motions. What are you talking about, dude? Sensing the escalating tension, two court officers step in behind Shu in case things get physical. Well, the case has been pending for quite a while. Mr. White has been representing you for quite a while. So Mr. White hasn't filed nothing. He just asked to re withdraw two different times. You keep denying it. That's the way it is, sir. So we'll see you on the 21st for jury trial. Oh, he had to throw a fit. And his attorney realized. Watch again. Fuck yeah, he, he is. He steps out of the wheelchair to flip the table. The officers force Shu back into the chair, but he's not going quiet. I'll be seeing you, you fucking F word. Shu ultimately kept White as his attorney, and it's a good thing he did. White worked a deal where Shu pled no contest to most of his charges and got a reduced sentence of two and a half years in a county jail. Uh, for all that litany of charges, yeah, I'd say he uh, did him a favor. Next, we're in Las Vegas, Nevada, for a bond revocation hearing for a defendant accused of violating his parole. A year earlier, 35-year-old Michael McDonald was released on bond while he awaited trial for charges including burglary, forgery, and perjury. The criminal charges stem from a long and contentious divorce and custody case 
It ended with his ex-wife being granted a no-contact order to keep McDonald away from her and their two children. Now, as he awaits trial on criminal charges, the state argues he violated his parole when he violated that no-contact order. One of his release conditions was to have no contact with the individual, his ex-wife. Um, approximately a month ago in June, he then mailed, mailed a number of items uh, to his wife's address. The items mentioned were actually gifts addressed to his children. McDonald's lawyer claims his client didn't know sending the items violated the no-contact order and argues he should be allowed to remain out on bond until his upcoming trial. He sent two gifts, that's it. No nasty notes with him. Uh, Mr. McDonald is not violent nor a threat to the community. He has had no uh, allegations of violence. The defense is presenting McDonald's actions as an innocent mistake. But Judge Kathy Hardcastle knows the history of the case and isn't buying it. I would note that back in family court, he constantly violated orders. He would always insist that the order said something else. The judge also cites McDonald's history of unstable behavior during his divorce that ultimately led to the no contact order being granted. I was the one who found that he was a potential danger to his children because he lied to the court about surrendering. Man, I was just going through here, y'all. Man, the fucking screenshots and shit I got is unbelievable. All right, hold on just a second. I'm about to set up something. We are going to be doing a game stream today. Or I'm going to try to do it. Uh, I had some... issues with it the last time I tried. Uh, thinking of maybe doing a G some GTA 5 game stream. I haven't played GTA 5 in so long and uh, I never like, I, I don't know, I got some desire to want to do the missions like the like I think there's like online multiplayer mission or something that, you know, I never got to do. Uh, I always played it like privately or whatever. Uh, let me see. Can't show you all this right now. I'm having to get into my network stuff. Where's the Wi-Fi? There we go. Oh, that's what I made the password. Okay. Nobody would ever figure that one out. It's a good thing I got that generator. Trying to get this PlayStation connected. Good. Fixed. What? Not enough storage. What the fuck? Yeah, I think I'm going to get rid of this just because.
Yeah, why don't we delete that? I ain't gonna play that game. All right, we'll go back to the video then for now. Oh, I deleted that quick. Hey, Grand Theft Auto is starting up. What do you know? There's 59 gigs available now.
I'm still here. I just don't know what the fuck is going on with this. I'm about to update that, check out that, and fuck with it a little bit more later on. Weapons. Uh, after he's been ordered to surrender his weapons, and that because of his bizarre behavior, that he's a tracking device on his wife's vehicle. And so I'm seeing the same type of conduct, and it's an obsession. It's a escalating course. I'm not sure that he is capable of controlling himself because he wasn't before. So based upon that, I am granting the motion. Moments after the judge makes her decision that McDonald did indeed violate the conditions of his parole, two court marshals approach McDonald with handcuffs. Put your hands behind your back. It's unclear what McDonald is trying to say to the judge as he pulls his arms away. What is clear is that McDonald is not ready to cooperate. Mike, calm down. Mike, calm down. Mike, calm down. Mike, calm down. Take a deep breath. Assistance in 15 charges. 15 charges. As you can hear, McDonald's attorney calmly tries to get him to settle down. I'm going to take her. Mike, you're not fighting with him. But as he continues to resist, even with the threat of being tased, his lawyers had enough. Mike, put the handcuffs on. I'll put them on myself. Come on, I'm on your side, Mike. Put your on. As additional officers come to restrain McDonald, he continues to plead his case. I just want to see my kids now being prosecuted as an enemy of the state. I just want to. Michael McDonald was found guilty of multiple counts of burglary, forgery, and perjury in relation to his divorce case and was sentenced to 24 to 68 months in Nevada State Prison with credit for 215 days served. And for refusing to be handcuffed during the hearing, McDonald picked up an additional charge of resisting an officer. St. John. Next, we take you inside the Harris County Courthouse in Houston, Texas. It's January 2021. The defendant is David St. John, who's in court for aggravated sexual assault of a child and felony possession of a weapon. St. John took a teenage girl to a hotel, then he allegedly raped her. The 39-year-old already had six felony convictions to his name and was out on bond for three other charges when the attack occurred. One of his pending charges was possession of the gun that was later used during the alleged assault. You are charged with the aggravated sexual assault of a child older than 14 or younger shit. than 17. As the you charges are, are being read, St. John seems a bit shifty. Then, completely unattended, he walks to the front row. Does he learn your lesson? Does he learn your lesson? Holy shit. St. John repeats the question, did you learn your lesson before cold cocking the man? The victim takes off as an officer rushes over and tackles St. John. Call someone, call someone, call someone. Oh, that hurt. Sit down, man. Just sit down. Hey. 
Even as he's being cuffed, St. John continues to offer advice. It's unclear why St. John attacked the man, but as he's escorted out, he makes a final comment. The victim of the attack seems to walk away unscathed. Are you okay, Mr. Randall? No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. And there were no additional charges brought against St. John. He remained in jail while awaiting his trial. Don't end it, Michael. Quit it! You want me to hit you again? Stay the f down! You want me to hit you again? We go to Houston, Texas for the trial of Terry Thompson. He's been charged with murder in the death of 24-year-old John Hernandez. The incident occurred at this restaurant when an intoxicated Hernandez, who's here with his wife, stepped outside the diner. That's when Thompson pulled up with his daughters and allegedly saw Hernandez urinating in the parking lot. Some words were exchanged, and according to Thompson, Hernandez threw a punch. In this footage, you can see Thompson in the red shirt wrestle Hernandez to the ground. He then puts Hernandez in a chokehold and gets on top of him. Meanwhile, Thompson's wife, Shauna, an off-duty sheriff's deputy, arrives at the scene. Quit it! You want me to hit you again? Stay the f down! You want me to hit you again? Stop uh, it! There's Shauna holding Hernandez's arm down. But the much larger Thompson has Hernandez pinned to the ground. The woman attempts to record the incident, but bystanders block her view while the struggle continues in the background. No, stop! Why are you recording? Just stop! Why you need to record? It's a legal record! Just stop! Thompson and his I wife don't. I do not like people like that try to block recording. Really let him up. But by then, Hernandez was unconscious. Holy shit. Realizing how serious the situation had become, Shauna began to administer CPR on Hernandez. Paramedics arrived and took him to the hospital. Three days later, Hernandez died from his injuries. Both Thompson and his wife were charged with murder, but not guilty. The trial of Terry Thompson ended in a hung jury as 11 of the 12 jurors voted not guilty. But since it was a hung jury, the state tried him a second time. This time, the prosecution adds new witnesses and digs into Thompson's past, claiming he was a violent man with a hot temper who had a history of assaulting his own children. They also showed footage of the incident in court, arguing Thompson used excessive force and had a defenseless Hernandez in a chokehold for over three minutes. At the moment, 24-year-old John Hernandez gives up. At the moment, 24-year-old John Hernandez taps out, and you continue, it's certainly not self-defense, and it's murder. Meanwhile, Thompson's attorney argued it was self-defense, and that Hernandez, who was drunk the night of the incident, was the true aggressor, and that according to his own wife, couldn't handle his alcohol. He's a mean drunk. He's a loudmouth. He's an ass. Those are her words, not mine. After hearing and seeing all the evidence presented, the jury returned with a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Terry Brian Thompson, guilty of murder. Before he learns his sentence, which could be anywhere from two years to life, Hernandez's wife shows Thompson some sympathy. You repent for what you did. I will forgive you. Because there's nothing I can do. There's nothing else to say. Now the terms of Thompson's sentence are read by Judge Kelly Johnson. Assess his punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for 25 years. Oh. Thompson was sentenced to 25 years in a Texas prison. Shouldn't have done the crime. And won't be eligible for parole until the year 2031. When he'll That's a lot sooner than the person they killed, though. He ain't never coming back. He'll be 55 years old. 
Thompson did file an appeal with the state, but it was denied. As for his wife, Shauna, she was fired from the sheriff's office. But the um, wow, the charges were dropped on her. Being a sheriff's office employee and everything, you'd think that she would have, number one, got once the dude was on the ground and stopped, like she would have got him to get off his neck and would have called the police. I don't think she she was there. She sh I see that. that that's some bullshit right there. Murder charge against. And and then people talk about male privilege. What what other male do you know that would have been with him that wouldn't have gotten uh? They wouldn't have gotten their uh. It was dropped. Would have got that charge dropped. Do you think? None. Prosecution believed. They did not have sufficient evidence to convict. They didn't have sufficient evidence to convict. What about the fact her husband was convicted and she was there? Is that not sufficient? Matthew Miller. Now to Miami, Florida, where a bond hearing is underway for 43-year-old Matthew Miller. The previous day, Miller left a gruesome scene at a grocery store. After he Damn. That's another thing. Um, they'll, they'll use this footage if I'm being stalked right now or anything. They'll use the footage of me saying that and say, oh, he's a misogynist. He's this, he's that. That's because a bunch of them are left wing, <laughs> like liberal trendies that, you know, support like, and, and it, they're hypocrites because uh, look what how they did and talked and dragged uh Chrissy Army vet through the mud and other women Andrea and so forth so on. You 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 guys only care about selective women. All right, ones that will help further your agenda. Like whenever I tried asking Roma for help and they said that we well, you know we'll go to war with you bitch and everything and they got her to to drop. Uh, because she was still saying that that both she was, she was saying both they didn't like how she was about both sides were wrong. They didn't like that. Yeah, two people inside. The reason and up at that point, she was addressing things uh, that I went went through last year, and some of the things that I went through last year, yeah, they were done naively or based on lack of uh, understanding or just negligence on my part, and I took a, accountability for them and everything, I don't have anything to do in that area when it regards to this year. Not at all. For the bloodshed? So he, he stabbed somebody over a chicken Caesar salad that he was stealing. <laughs> oh, this is not the time to laugh, buddy. Yes, you heard correctly. Chicken Caesar salad. Well, I don't like salads, so I can't relate. So he, he stabbed somebody over a chicken Caesar salad that he was saying. <laughs> it's not how funny could have killed the victim. Miller stabbed an employee in the chest and another in the knee after they confessed. That's two sliced over salad, one tossed in jail. Somebody was really trying to be creative with adding that word tossed and huh. fronted him while he was trying to steal an eight dollar salad. Miller was arrested soon after. The two victims were taken to eight dollar salad, dude. This is the only guy I think I've seen in front of Miss Glazer where they're not gonna like Oh, I know you. Da, da, da. Yeah, there's not gonna be no happiness here, especially with that disrespectful little <laughs> hospital in stable condition. So you shouldn't have got involved in a salad. You're not supposed to steal. And you're not supposed to stab people over a salad or anything else. Miller may think the whole ordeal is humorous, but the charges he faces could land him in prison for life. Mr. Miller, you were arrested for two counts of armed robbery with a firearm or deadly weapon, two counts of aggravated battery, one count of retail theft, one count possession of drug paraphernalia. So do whatever you need to do and let me go back to my cell. This is just nonsense. He wasn't even a real person. He wasn't even a real person. 
Excuse what? me? What? I couldn't hear you. Why don't you put the volume on so I can hear him? It, what did he say? It wasn't a real person? Right. Considering the severity of... It wasn't a real person. They're really in the hospital. Miller's charges. Judge Mindy Glazer makes it clear she does not want him released from custody. For the yeah. record, I'm making a preliminary finding of proof, evident presumption. Great to hold you no bond. Good day. Oh, shit. I don't care what you say, lady. My family is CIA. That means we got authority of you and your mom friends. <laughs> <laughs> Miller would later be found guilty of one count of armed robbery with a deadly weapon and two counts of aggravated battery and was sent to a mental health facility for treatment. Thanks for being a fan. Of See, now that guy was actually committed by a judge. Or reverse. Oh, shit. Do I even want to look at any of the YouTube? Uh-oh. Verdict watch. Somebody said he guilty on Crip. Ran for a guilty verdict. Not guilty, please. I didn't think they would. I guess whenever they don't have a verdict, they. Stop asking when the verdict will be. It'll be whenever they reach one. Yeah, it could be tomorrow when it. Free lube for Melly. This rat is guilty. <laughs> All 12 have to say guilty or not. They do. They do. Only eight have to say, though, for a death. Wayward with history. My favorite channel. Good to see you, Michael. You too. It's been too long. You believe it's finally here? No. Not really. Are you ready? As I'll ever be. Part of me wishes we didn't have to do this. Yeah, me too. And why are we? Oh, you know why. I have no choice after what you did. What I did? What if it's not my fault? What is that supposed to mean? Think about it. Dad made everything. Which means he made me who I am. God wanted the devil. So? So why? And why make us fight? I just can't figure out the point. What's your point? We're going to kill each other. And for what? One of Dad's tests. We don't even know the answer. We're brothers. Let's just walk off the chessboard. I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. I'm a good son, and I have my orders. You don't have to follow them. What, you think I'm gonna rebel now? I'm not like you. Please, Michael. No, you haven't changed a bit, little brother. Always blaming everybody but yourself. We were together, we were happy, but you betrayed me, all of us, and you made our father leave. No one makes dad do anything. He is doing this to us. You're a monster, Lucifer. And I have to kill you. 
It's the way it's got to be. And I'd like to see you try. Hey, we need to talk. Dean, even for you, this is a whole new mountain of stupid. Are you tired? Really? <laughs> you know what? Let me tell you a couple things. First of all, we got to blow this taco stand before who knows what happens to my son. And second of all, you're the reason that we are even stuck in this literally godforsaken place to begin with. So I'm sorry you're tired. It's not my fault you were born a wimpy little human with your wimpy little lungs and your weak little legs. What? You heard me. Don't say another word on this trip, OK? Ah, just what I need. Angels. Hey. I sense a creature that stinks of hell. Oh, yeah, that would be her. False. Identify yourself. I'm Lucifer. False. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm Lucifer. You want to tell this guy who I am? False. Lucifer was killed by the Archangel Michael. What? This place is nuts. Freeze. Oh, what are you going to? What, are you going to smite me? On my command. Oh, for the love of no! Ah! He who hesitates disintegrates. <laughs> is he kidding? I mean, even in the land of Bizarro, an angel isn't going to try to. Oh, come on! You should be dead. Okay, and who are you and what spaghetti western coughed you up? Don't you know me, brother? Michael. You are Lucifer. I can feel it. But how is that even possible? Uh, you know, alternate universes, interdimensional travel, blah, blah, blah. It's her fault. Uh, I'll buy that you're Michael, but you sort of seem like a cheap knockoff to the one I left behind. And he's a hot mess. I killed my Lucifer. Tore him apart in the skies over Abilene. Hey, can't get enough of a good thing. Okay, why not? Heart? No, oh, it's kind of whippy. What are you going to do? Kill me? Or oh, uh, maybe not. Maybe I need you. I got plenty of gripes with the old man. His self-righteous narcissism is my way or the highway quirk. And I got to hand it to him. He had a couple of great seconds when he banged out the universe. I had creative jobs and optimism. I'll give him that. And despite his pissiness and his massive lack of irony, he did give mankind a good turn at that. 
and a chance to live in paradise. Rolled in smooth, parted waters, worshipped by creatures who made God in man's image, and then he got disappointed, or worse, bored. Picked up all his toys and left. What was that? Hitched a ride on your temporal lobe. Saw your world. That paradise you left behind? I believe I'll take up residence. Lend my guiding hand. Ah, of course. Because you've done such wonders with this place. While I was in your head, I saw what you were afraid of. Being locked up again, like you were in the cage. So, after I'm done, you'll be left here, alone, in agony, forever. Okay, bro, could you do me a favor? Eat me. I got an idea. Why don't you wail on Mary Winchester for a while? I'll go get a latte, okay? <laughs> or not. Look at you. Claim to be a god in your world. Here, you're pathetic. <laughs> hey, you try interdimensional travel sometime, pal. Definitely no frills. And just to be clear, I never claim to be god or a god, okay? Where I come from, god is a paradox. He's everywhere in your mind. In reality, he's nowhere. He left. I, on the other hand, am the real deal. I am everything humanity thinks I am and worse. That's who you're dealing with, pal. But hey, congratulations to you for being king of the hill of this dead rock. Unlike you, I'll be trading up. Oh, you mean to the earth. Sort of need that pesky little rift. Well, that trade off, right? And it's, oh, missing for now. I consider myself a man with a plan. Alternate universes, not knows. We've been exploring the idea. We. Bring him in. The greatest minds on this dead rock, including our prophet of law. Kevin? Kevin Tran? Have we met? Uh, we had one of you in our world. The other you is dead. Don't care. What do you have for me? I, uh, I've assembled all the elements annotated in the angel tablets. Of course, I haven't done this before. No one here has, and any predictions are only predictive, not declarative probabilities being what they are, could be, maybe, or not. But a fly in the ointment exists. Yes. The key ingredient. Archangel Grace, which you have refused to donate. Don't screw with me, worm. I'm a vertebrate. Neither an analid nor an nematode. I don't yeah. need to waste my grace. And there's plenty in the cover. All right, touch me and I'll take it. Don't worry. I won't take it all. Save some for a rainy day. <laughs> Say ah. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen. Lou, you don't really want to try this again, do you? Um, yeah.
gave me? Go. I can buy some time. Gabriel, don't. All I did on Earth was run. I'm not running anymore. What are you doing, man? I'm hurt. Please. How did you think this was going to end? Why should I trust you? I saw how they do the spell. I know what it takes. It's some blood, some fruit, a glowy rock, and then... Bam, we step through, both of us. And then? And then I get my son. And you get everything else. Are we agreed? Guys, I don't have a choice! If we do this, it's a one-time deal. I'm in charge. You're the engine, but I'm behind the wheel. Understand? I could. I probably should execute you. I mean, really, really use my imagination. But I'm feeling generous today. So one of you is going to walk out that door and the other one will be laying dead on the ground. You choose. No. Oh, you could do that. I can murder you both and end all life in the universe. <laughs> you make it in my image better than that ever could. I'm thinking, mm, fire breathing dragons, sassy talking robots. <laughs> I might give humans another chance if they know their place and worship me because I've earned it but hey it'll probably take a few days to unravel the universe maybe uh, seven ten days top so maybe this maybe one of you can stop me maybe well let's see clock's ticking guys Don't, don't! 
you see me. <laughs> you let my brother in. Well, it turns out you and I have something in common. We both want to gut your ass. Four stars, baby. Well, you try it, Dean. I'll give you that, buddy. I'm not just powerful enough. I am power. And I don't need a blade to end you, pal. Dean! Goodbye, Dean. <laughs> Sure to subscribe to Wayward Winchester for some more awesome content, what? and remember, no chick flick You're moment. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you too, I guess. <laughs>